Um, my name is Barb Enlin. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Medicine. And I went to school in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So I'm just completing the circle of connections here. Oh, I'm sorry we didn't have time for these. These are great. Please tell us what to do. <laughs> Oh, this is perfect. Plant good things in your brain. And actually, I'm going to talk about this um, in my presentation. I'll be speaking on microbes and Alzheimer's disease. And I am um, starting my presentation as well with just uh, with a short story. Um, we're interested in factors that can increase or decrease risk uh, for dementia and really trying to figure out, you know, why do some people show healthy trajectories of aging and, and other people don't. And so I have an example of two individuals here. Um, this woman on the left, uh, does anybody know who this is? This is Pat Summit. Uh, she coached the um, Lady Vols uh, basketball team, women's basketball team. And when she retired, she had the most uh, wins of any uh, coach in women's or men's uh, collegiate uh, basketball. And she uh, was very successful. She retired when she was 59, though, when she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, uh, dementia. And she passed away five years later um, at the age of 64. Um, on the other side, uh, we have uh, Dr. John Kaka Gisek, uh, who lived in, um, in the Lake of the Woods region. And he, as far as I know, is the person to live uh, the oldest documented life up to the age of 124. Uh, so he lived in Minnesota, and he was um, a medicine man, and he was actively working on his trap line up until the age of 110. So here we have two people with very different trajectories of aging. Um, and so Dr. Henderson talked about differences in genetics. That's certainly something that we know contributes. But we also know, for example, even among uh, genetically identical twins who have the same genetics, that there can be differences in terms of their age of onset of Alzheimer's dementia, um, up to a documented 18 years difference where one twin develops the disease um, Alzheimer's dementia and the other one doesn't. So there are other factors that we believe play a role. Uh, one of the things that um, my lab and, and uh, in collaboration with others on campus have been looking at is the contribution of gut microbiome. And this is something that you may have heard about in the media, but if, if not, that's fine. I'll tell you a little bit about what we're talking about. Um, when we're talking about microbes, we're talking about very small organisms that are everywhere in our environment. And the ones that we're interested in live in and on our body. And this includes bacteria, viruses, fungi. And with regards to where they are on our body, this is a map of where they are on our skin. Uh, the majority of them actually live in our gut, uh, where they play very important roles in health. How many of these little microorganisms that we can't see are in and on our body? Um, actually, more of them than there are human cells. Uh, so there are about 38 trillion microbial cells in and on our body versus only 30 trillion human cells. Uh, they're very, very small, so by weight, we are still more human. Um, with regards to genetics, um, if we're talking about humans, we have 25,000 genes or less. With regard to microbes, because there are so many different kinds, the genetics is much, much higher, so 3.3 million genes. And if you think, you know, we are not really in the practice of changing human genetics, but we might be able to modify the microbes that live in and on our bodies. So if we're interested in the microbes that are in our gut, how do we study them? Uh, the main way that we do this is actually to look at stool samples, because what's in our gut comes out, and then we can actually use those stool samples to see what is in the gut. Um, so we use a, a type of genetic sequencing to figure out uh, what is there, how much is there, how many different kinds of things are there. Another really interesting tool we have for figuring out what microbes do in health is to study animals, and in this case, mice. 
mice that have been kept germ-free, so they've never been exposed to any germs. And then what we can do is we can introduce microbes and see what happens to their health. So let me just tell you a quick story about some research done here on campus, well, actually done by an investigator here on campus, um, Dr. Federico Ray in the Department of Bacteriology. And he was studying obesity. And he has a colony of these mice that are kept germ-free. They've never been exposed to any microbes. And if you feed these mice a high-fat and high-sugar diet, they do not gain weight. Okay, that doesn't mean that we should all become germ-free and live in, in this bubble because it's not very enriching. Um, but then what they did was really, really interesting. So they wanted to figure out how human microbes would affect obesity. So what they did was they collected stool samples from twins where one twin was normal weight and the other twin was overweight. Now what you can do is take those stool samples and give them to the mice so that they have a human gut microbiome. If you give these mice a stool sample from a normal weight twin and feed them a high fat, high sugar diet, they do not gain weight. If you take a stool sample from the overweight twin and give it to these mice and then feed them a high fat, high sugar diet, the mice gain weight and they also develop basically type two diabetes. So there is something in those gut microbes that's really influencing the health of the mice and presumably of the humans as well. So we know that uh, these microbes have been studied in the context of a lot of diseases that affect the gut. So uh, things like Crohn's and colitis, metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes. But that, now there's more research looking at the effects of these microbes on the brain. And that is because the gut is actually well connected with the brain through something called the vagus nerve. And also these microbes in the gut produce signaling molecules that send messages to the brain. And this is a very, very close connection. And this is a list of just some of the brain conditions and brain diseases that have been associated with gut microbiome. And probably all of, out of all of these, the one that's been most studied in terms of the context of neurodegenerative disease is Parkinson's. Uh, in fact, there's a pretty um, interesting emerging story about Parkinson's because some of the brain pathology that you see in Parkinson's, the abnormal accumulation of alpha-synuclein pathology, is also found in the gut. So there's a theory that the disease might even start in the gut. Um, with regard to Alzheimer's disease, we're looking at a different kind of pathology. We're looking at beta amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. And what's super interesting is if you take a mouse that overproduces beta amyloid and you keep it germ-free, it does not develop as many amyloid plaques in the brain. If you then put microbes in the brain of those animals, the amyloid comes in to actually sequester the microbe. And there's a theory that potentially um, microbes or microbial products getting into the brain could actually instigate this accumulation of the beta amyloid plaque. Now this is a theory in Alzheimer's disease. This is something that people are working on and needs more study. So we at Wisconsin have been looking at gut microbiome differences in people with and without Alzheimer's dementia. So these are research participants that come in um, and participate in all of the procedures that we ask them to do. They're very generous with their time. Um, some participants um, even undergo a lumbar puncture to provide cerebral spinal fluid, which tells us about uh, pathology in the brain. Um, and then the easy part is providing the stool sample. So that part is done at home. And what we were interested in was seeing if in Alzheimer's disease there's differences um, in the gut microbiome. And what we did was to see what was there um, and how much was there and also how diverse was the gut microbiome. So if you think kind of, of a healthy ecosystem, there's lots of different kinds of plants and animals, that would be considered healthy because it's very diverse versus a lack of diversity or monoculture. That's what you might see in a disease state. 
Uh, and this work was carried out by Nick Vogt, who's a student at the university, an MD-PhD student. And what he found was that actually in Alzheimer's disease, there's decreased diversity, so not as many things uh, in the gut. Um, but of course, once people develop dementia, their diet changes, they're also on medications that could affect the gut. Um, so what Nick did was to actually look at that cerebral spinal fluid and look in people who did not have dementia. And what he found was that um, even in those individuals, um, the bacteria in the gut that he was studying were related to the pathology that you see in the brain. So there is this link between the gut bacteria and what you see in the brain even before people develop dementia. And the studies in the, in the mice are ongoing. So if we know that the gut um, influences the brain, how do we change what's going on in our gut? So there's a, different, there's a number of different things that affect um, your gut microbiome. We get most of our microbes when we're born from our mother. If we have a normal, uh, or if we, under, if we have a, a vaginal birth, then we will have the same microbes as our mother. Um, who we live with actually influences our gut microbes. In fact, your gut microbes start to look more like your spouse than even your siblings over time. And that's actually more so the case if you get along with your spouse. Um, we know that antibi antibiotics can affect uh, gut microbiome. Um, and diet, of course, is one that uh, significantly affects gut microbiome. Uh, this is very briefly just an interesting study looking at immigration. Um, and these were uh, native Cairn and Hmong individuals who lived in Thailand. They were studied in their native Thailand. They actually had very diverse gut microbiomes. Uh, when they moved to the United States, they lost diversity. Um, and their offspring, so their children and the next generation, also lost gut diversity. So there was a westernization of the gut microbiome. And that was also associated with greater uh, obesity. Um, in contrast, uh, from the American Gut Project, they compared individuals, they looked at gut microbiomes, and they compared individuals who ate 30 or more different plants per week to people who lay ate 10 or less different plants per week. And eating uh, greater, 30 or greater different kinds of plants per week was associated with greater diversity. Um, the last um, little bit that I wanted to talk about, if there was a more radical change of the gut microbiome, um, that would involve a fecal microbiota transplant. And a fecal microbiota transplant, or stool transplant, means actually taking stool from a healthy donor and using it to increase diversity in someone who has reduced diversity. And some of you may have heard about this in the context of C. difficile, a hospital-acquired infection. Um, actually, at our UW hospital, they use stool transplant to treat C. difficile if it doesn't respond to antibiotics. So you can take someone who has a depleted diversity of microbes and use a stool transplant to increase uh, diversity. And so there's now a number of studies around the country, clinical trials, that are testing stool transplant for a number of different diseases. And uh, in Wisconsin, uh, we have the first uh, feasibility study uh, to test this among individuals with Alzheimer's dementia. Uh, so in summary, um, in that short amount of time we had, we'll have questions um, at the end. But what is it that you need to know about microbes? So microbes have been linked to a number of health conditions. They're starting to be linked to brain diseases. Um, and they, it needs a lot more research to figure out what are those mechanisms. Um, but we believe that this could be potentially another opportunity uh, for intervention. All right, thank you. <laughs>